a, this part of the, uh, of the morning is dedicated to a, a case story. Uh, because this is a case discussion portion, I uh, warmly invite you to be interactive, asking questions, making comments, or disagree simply, which is very important. Let's start with the, with the case. There are a number of different points that we can discuss together at certain points of the evolution of this case. We have a, a man, at the age of 60, who is a Navy smoker, even though it's not uh, categorized as COPD patient. And uh, he used to smoke more than one pack of, of cigarettes per day. And he, at home, developed a cough, some fever, and it was, the, the phenomenon is lasting four days with a mild dyspnea and uh, the uh, general practitioner started at home a, an empirical therapy with levofloxacin given orally. The, the guy, sorry, the guy had a right lower lobe infiltration as soon as he entered the hospital and the fever at the moment he was admitted was 38.2 grade centigrade. The white blood cell count was more than 13,000 and the neutrophils, 87%. PAO2, FIO2, white breathing, Venturi mask was 280. Persistent mild dyspnea. And then at that, at that moment, because the general stable condition the uh, doctor who admitted the patient to the hospital decided to move the patient to the infectious disease department. Up to now, it's, it's clear enough. Apparently simple case. But unfortunately, the, is the case that as soon he is admitted into the infectious disease department, his PAO2, FU2 deteriorates to 100 while he's on high flow oxygen therapy. There was a worsening of the dyspnea and appeared some hypotension. Let's say blood pressure, systolic blood pressure below 90 millimeters of mercury. At that point, because the patient uh, is considered a risky patient, the doctors in the, the infectious disease department uh, decided to move into the ICU, where a non-invasive trial was started. At this point, I would ask you, how do you behave? Would you do exactly the same thing? Should start a trial of uh, non-invasive ventilation, as is proposed in the slide? Should you intubate the patient right away? Would you like to do something else? Would you change the antibiotic therapy? Would you perform some special analysis to better address the situation? It's your turn, please. PCO2, PCO2 is normal. PCO2 is normal, uh, even lower. I would say it's tachypneic. So it was, if I remember well, it was something like 30 or 29 millimeters of mercury. Low, low. Low, low, low. Yeah, low PCO2. <coughs> what, what, what does that mean? Tell me. Why did you ask about PCO2? Who cares? <laughs> because you can discuss the hypoxemic status only without Yes. If you are hypercapnesis, you should ventilate for the medication. This is the solution. But not being hyper. Do you think it's good that PCO2 is low? Pardon me? Do you think it's a good thing that PCO2 is low? No, I don't think it is uh, a good thing. I think that his patient is tachypnea, is still is made. But this is the reason why the doctor in charge decided to start a trial of non-invasive ventilation. So uh, I would like just to have some collaboration coming from the audience. Oh. Come on, don't be shy. 
Who's not happy with the non invasive NDA? Raise up your hands, those who are against. The APH is normal, and there is, for the moment, not uh, any acidosis related to hypoperfusion and lactate reduction. Pami? Oh, please. I would like to intubate the patient first and then think about him later, sir. I can't hear from you. I would like to intubate the patient instead of giving the NIV trial. Sorry, maybe the, the sound is distorted from there and I cannot hear precisely what you said. I wouldn't like to give the NIV trial to this patient. He seems to be in a hypoperfused state. He is having an hypotension, he is worsening. I would like to give an NIV trial. I wouldn't like to give an NIV trial. Instead of I'll give an intubate the patient and go pit, give him an invasive mechanical. Uh, but the, the, the idea of going to mechanical ventilation. Ah, okay. So you you would start a an invasive mechanical ventilation. This is the point. Yes. So you you should intubate the patient right away. Okay. Someone else want to make another comment or suggestions? Please. Over there. There is one question there, another one here. What was the patient's mental status? The patient's mental status. Oh, the, me the mental status. The mental status is absolutely normal. It's all only you need a worried because he is dismayed. Please, there are another question over there. Um, would you? Latate. Lactate is still, is still normal, I just alluded it before, despite the fact that it was high, slightly hypotensive because it was 90 millimeter of mercury, is systolic pressure, lactate are within the normal limit, let's say two millimoles per, uh, per liter. Raise up your voice. Okay, so one of the concepts that uh, he's in the room is that uh, as soon as you have some more uh, important hemodynamic instability, most of you are suggesting to intubate the patient right away. Okay. What was the real urine creatinine? Uh, the urine creatinine for the moment is normal. Mm -hmm. What's the risk of non invasive? Uh, simply because uh, is, you may try a trial. The PAO2, if PAO2 uh, deteriorates, is, is not so terrible. But for the moment, the hemodynamic stability uh, can allow also make a trial. At least this is what has been done uh, with this patient. I'm not saying that it's the best solution. I'm simply depicting the case as it was. Uh, the uh, additional comment I may make is that uh, uh, we do have a margin of uh, uh, uncertainty because if you look at the suggestion given by the paper that uh, Sami Jaber alluded to in uh, his presentation, uh, we, we do have a room for uh, the non-invasive ventilation for those patients uh, who, are, who do have a mild LDS. Uh, something in between 300 and 200. This patient is at the border. Uh, I know that uh, uh, one of the essential elements that was stressed already by Samir is the experience of the team, the skill of the team that has to treat the patient. And in this case, there are different opinions, uh, as well as on the uh, preservation of the spontaneous breathing because of the uh, increased uh, transpulmonary pressure due to the inspiratory swing. This is the other concern that in general is uh, really advanced. Massimo, Massimo, friend of mine told me that non-invasive ventilation kills the RDS3. You know, uh, I think that uh, this is uh, something that we are still discussing and will debate for a very long time. And one of the reasons uh, why uh, this is uh, 
a form of concern for some is related to the fact that uh, a, a number of things that regards patients in a spontaneous breathing are indeed uh, a pure extrapolation for what happens in patients who are intubated and uh, on spontaneous breathing. Unfortunately, because of the difficulty of measuring some of the essential parameters when a patient, a non-intubated patient, is spontaneous breathing, let's say, under pressure support, non-invasive pressure support, increases the margin of uncertainty and perplexity. So it's something that we should be measured, but it's, as you know, it's very difficult. One of the points is that one. Uh, the transmural pressure that uh, we allude to is in general increased because the in inspiratory swing. But as soon as you apply a uh, pressure support, one of the things that uh, you achieve is just the, uh, you reduce the workload of the respiratory muscle. So the inspiratory swing is reduced. We do not know how much, then the combination of the variation of transmural pressure and the reduction of the inspiratory swing is something that remains a big question mark, at least in my opinion. It's more purely speculative, I understand that, but... Do you, do you people accept these uh, ideas about non-invasive ventilation? Everything is straightforward? Is it easier telling the truth? <laughs> okay. I'm just expressing my personal opinion, but uh, as a matter of fact, we have to consider that as soon as we apply to this kind of patient, these are results coming from our group. We are an urgent question. Oh, please. In my opinion, what you're saying has something to, to do with the, uh, what uh, Samir said before. If the, uh, if the team is expert, a, sh a very short trial, looking at the potential improvement of the patient and maintenance of the uh, hemodynamic stability in general condition may be attempted. But it simply means that, if, for example, if after one hour, you didn't achieve the expected improvements, then I'm the first, even though I'm fond of non-invasive ventilation, I will be the first to intubate the patient. And one of the reasons is that one. If you look at the uh, survey that we have done, uh, a treating, looking at patients with hypoxemia, uh, almost 400 patients, those who, are, who had RDS, uh, were, in the, were indeed those patients who had uh, a percentage of failure depicted by the black squares, which is quite high and ranging something in between 40 and 60 percent. Very risky patient. And one of the things that we should always consider that as soon as you look at the patient uh, who are treated right away on non-invasive ventilation, you can have a higher percentage of failure, but you have also a not negligible for certain patients percentage of success. Then, the other question that I want to ask you, have you seen that the patient started with high flow oxygen therapy? The high flow oxygen therapy may be considered a, a, the right approach of the, in these patients. What do you think? Nobody knows. May I ask you how many of you do use the high flow oxygen therapy in these patients, at least in the early phases of the disease? Could you rise up your hands? So I would say that 20% of the, these patients. May I ask you for how long? Why, why, why?
However, if you look at the data coming from the literature, indeed uh, the, the, the situation is even more intriguing as often the high flow oxygen therapy is considered uh, equivalent uh, or if not better uh, respect to the uh, non-invasive ventilation therapy in these patients, even those who are severe. Because if you look at this study where there is a, the, this is a specific subset of patients, these are the immunocompromised, but the concept is there. You can see that even if these patients, most of these patients uh, included in this study, had a PaO2, FeO2, which was below 200, nonetheless, their final outcome was quite good and not different between those who received right away the non-invasive pressure support. So apparently, even though there are some uh, concern regarding the uh, kind of approach that has been used by applying non-invasive ventilation in these patients, nonetheless, the message is there. Apparently, these subset of population can be approached, at least for a short trial, uh, so, or with the high flow oxygen therapy, or with non-invasive ventilation. Yes. Again, uh, as, as I explained, this is very provocative, but, uh, and um, I'm very happy that you are provocative. But uh, my comment concerning these two major papers. Yes, of course. But uh, uh, my point concerning these two papers, the one coming from the French group, uh, Frat is the uh, first author for the New England Journal of Medicine paper, and uh, Lemial uh, for this paper. In both cases, there was uh, a way to apply non-invasive ventilation that may be questionable. Short trials, uh, very short trials, with a relatively long interruption, and uh, not a comparable experience, not very well protocolized the way to deliver non-invasive ventilation. And on top of that, if you compare something that can give, in a way or another, a small amount of people like the, a similar way to the CPAP, like can do the high flow oxygen therapy, to a condition where you start with non-invasive ventilation for, let's say, a couple of hours, you interrupt that and we con you continue with the, with the con conventional oxygen therapy, you are, uh, you are applying a perfect model to having recruitment and the recruitment, the recruitment and the recruitment, one of the way to induce uh, VD. And possibly this is something that has influenced the final outcome. On top of that, the difference in mortality, and I will conclude uh, in uh, making my personal considerations, in the study published in the New England, uh, the mortality that uh, makes the difference between those receiving non-invasive ventilation with respect to those who were receiving high flow oxygen therapy was due in large part to uh, the cardiovascular failure to uh, cardiovascular shock or septic shock. The relationship between non-invasive ventilation and shock is indeed quite faint. And I, would, I wouldn't say that uh, this is the real reason why. So our speaker says that uh, high oxygen is good and non-invasive ventilation is good. So this is what they, we, might, we might try both. We may try both, at least. At least. This is what the literature says. <coughs> but let's move on. This is the... Chest, uh, chest, uh, chest scan of this patient with bilateral infiltrate, severe dyspnea, PaO2, FeO2 during NIVs was even worsen after what, just one hour, the respiratory rate increased, and uh, we have the, still the activation of uh, the, uh, the, active, uh, the muscle of respiration, the heart rate uh, increased, uh, but at this point, we do have also the blood that day that uh, went up. What should you do at this point? Maybe something that uh, someone else has suggested to do since the very beginning. So what's the source of lactate? 
the patient uh, is unstable now from the hemodynamic point of view and the slight hypotension that he had at the beginning worsened. In other words, the patient is possibly in septic shock. Yeah. Then, we, are all, we all agree that we have to intubate the patient. Immediately intubated, BL performed. No, 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 this is the fault of the patient, I would say. <laughs> I think that this is not a default of non-invasive ventilation. It's simply the fact that the patient uh, uh, deteriorating uh, had the only chance to, to be intubated and carefully monitored. Then, uh, in this patient has been taken the samples uh, for culture, urine, and blood, and started also the neuromuscular blocking agents. Uh, after that, the patient was put prone. Then my question are, my questions are, should you do the same? Should you do the same? Would you? Intubate. Intubate, intubate, intubate I think that. Uh, intubate is very powerful, right? Who should not, who would not have intubated this way? Nobody. Nobody, I think that at this point, okay. nobody hesitate, will hesitate. Then, should you give the neuromuscular blocking agent right away since, the, since now? Should you keep the spontaneous breathing? Do, don't you have any doubt concerning the presentation that has been made this morning where the uh, thickness of the diaphragm is r dramatically reduced and the activity of the muscles can be compromised after even a short period of neuromuscular blocking agent and mechanical ventilation? Yes or no? I'm, I'm trying to be provocative. You know, you know, septic patients. Yeah. Septic patients. Their diaphragm suffers if you do not Please. So you are telling me that uh, uh, the uh, use of neuromuscular blocking agent is related to the um, evolution of the PaO2, FiO2. If the patient uh, not being paralyzed is improving his uh, oxygenation, PaO2, you, you shouldn't give him or her any neuromuscular blocking agent. Is that correct? And uh, what to say with the uh, study coming from the French uh, part of the world, where indeed uh, curarizing, uh, giving the neuromuscular blocking agent since the very beginning, don't forget that these patients were severe. They, do, uh, they did have the same PO2, FiO2 of our patient went better. Because if we look at the literature, the message is there. And apparently, this is one of the way to improve the outcome of our patient, just paralyzing them for 24, let's say, 48 hours, just saving their life. So I wouldn't wait until the, there is a, or not an improvement. I should. Staying along this line, I should start right away with a, a neuromuscular blocking agent. Don't you think so? Yes, of course, but uh, what is important to precise is uh, how, how long do we, do we wait? What, what I mean that I do, I do not start to intubate patient and immediately start uh, an MDA, but uh, this doesn't mean that I will wait for two or three but this is not what the, the paper says. 
the paper say, give, gives us a, a different message. Okay. Well, but they had a low view to when they were incubated, not before. Yes, true. So our uh, discussion here is asking you whether the PO2 had improved after incubation. Okay. It did not, right? It did not. Who? Which kind of beat did you do? Did you try beat before an MBA? Yes, of course. And does uh, that did not have any effect? Didn't have a major effects. What if ten of me would have raised PO2 and PO2 to 180? Have you been using an MBA? Over there. We have to look also where this question is pressure. This question of plateau pressure, what the consideration is to Plateau pressure, you mean? Plateau pressure was within the 30, uh, the magic 30 millimeter, uh, centimeter of water limit, so the patient should be in a safe condition provided the fact that uh, uh, the protective ventilator strategy, which means also the, the other magic 6 ml for, uh, for ideal body weight was applied. So the patient was put, uh, as the, the suggestion coming from the evidences, under a protective ventilator strategy. May, may we <clears throat> probably one, another consideration that we may make, it depends upon the, uh, the size of the patient. If a patient is, may, would be obese, but this is not the case for our patient, the things may be different because in this case you may get uh, apparently a higher plateau pressure but if you use the esophageal balloon and then you measure the real trans moral pressure may be something different because a lar large part of the problem may be related to the chest wall and then the decreased compliance. Please, from Toronto. And nobody knows yeah, exactly. that the problem. He knows that. He's working on that. He knows that doesn't tell us. Ah, that's the point, because there is a study ongoing that uh, you don't want to reveal us the preliminary results. Tell us the truth. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Ah, you are not sure. <laughs> this is a From diplomatic right. answer. Let's, let's go back to the previous question. That was whether the patient <laughs> I understand correctly whether the patient was not sedated enough that could have caused high plateau pressures. Is that your point? Yeah, that's our point. Now, if, if the patient is not sedated enough and plateau pressure is high, since uh, sedation does not cure compliance, should we care? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Well, common sense tells me that we should increase sedation. But I, I doubt that is a mechanism of ventilator induced lung injury. What do you think? Uh, I think that could be correct, but my personal question is uh, does it make a major difference if you have an apneic sedation or you paralyze your patient? This is an open question, because if you render apneic your patient with sedation, do we need really the neuromuscular blocking agents? Are we sure about that? 
I don't think so, but, but this is a personal opinion. We do have another question or comment? And what about the putting the passion prone? That's more work. That's more work. Most of That's true. So you have a question? <coughs> the problem is that in a modern study of this patient, we have, I say, more than five, and we know that the hypothermic is a great disorder indication of prone position. That's correct. So it's very important to uh, assess the hypothermic statue of our patient if he is uh, on vasoactive uh, drugs. I can tell you that after a, a good uh, volume replacement therapy and a small amount of noradrenaline, uh, the patient uh, maintain a good, a stable hemodynamic condition. And should you prone this patient after having restored the hemodynamic stability, even in presence of a small amount of noradrenaline? So I don't see a contraindication personally. What about the others? What is your major concern about the proning the patient? It's a complicate. It's an increased workload for nurses and doctors. Swollen face, awful to see. At times, but it depends. There are some techniques that render the things quite easy. However, why, who does that, somebody here, does never prone the patient, right? Since only 20, 25% prone people, so the other ones do not prone. Can you tell us why you do not prone the patient? I would like just to have a comment coming from those who do not prone the patient, why they are let's say, against or not in favor of, which is the reason why they are concerned about the prone positioning. Not Just one of those who doesn't do that, please. Not opinions? It's a problem of uh, too much work, too much nursing load, you don't believe. I can add something that uh, may seem anecdotal apart from the, the study that I'm going to show you in a minute. That often when you have these patients with deterioration of the PaO2, FiO2, when you put them prone, you may see spectacular improvement and at times may make major difference. And just also to uh, have an additional comment to hemodynamic uh, influence, if you put the patient prone, you may get some additional advantages also in terms of hemodynamic conditions. And you will not have the weight of the heart just pushing over uh, the, the rest of the lung. Do you agree, Samir? Please. You want Samir? No, no, Samir is yet already.
now when we say the patient is no longer the fanfare of everyone worrying, everyone being scared, it's what we do normally, it's routine now. So what you're saying that in other world we may have a sort of a fast algorithm just looking at the patient, how he improves. If the patient improves without proning, just applying the protective strategy is fine. If it doesn't, you go on uh, applying neuromuscular blocking agents and after that proning the patient. So we, we work for my personal practice and it's shared by not all my colleagues, most of my colleagues, it's a very, very aggressive approach such that if someone comes in with you know, peer ratios of less than 100, 150, something like that, we work very, very quickly. Even in the borderline just above 200, we work very quickly as well. We escalate very quickly such that we're not stuck with No, 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 no. This should be done at least in, in less than one day. But you see that uh, this was the result of the Claude Guerin study in France. He improved dramatically the, uh, also the survival of these patients, just putting them prone. Just to, to compare what you said, uh, maybe we can consider in this type of patient we have an prophylactic effect of the uh, worsening of the effect of lung uh, injury use of clinician. We participate to two study in our center and this cumulative effect of all what is good for upper demotivation, lung demotivation, neurotic. But in my opinion, in my experience, because we do a lot of some patients in the two study, probably we decrease the worsening This is something that uh, a lot of people believe. The only thing that uh, at least uh, leaves a little bit um, dubious is the fact that the improvement of mortality is at 90 days. It's a long period of time after the neuromuscular blocking agent uh, paralyzing. So, paralysis, sorry. There are, there are a couple of studies on proning that are strongly in favor. That one coming from Jordi Mancebo in Spain, and this one that is quite valid. So I think despite the fact that uh, it increases the workload, nonetheless, it's true that there is a, a clear-cut advantage that is also shown by the everyday clinical life experience. So, I don't know, but... Uh, uh, the other point was uh, I wanted to touch was the use of the driving pressure for these patients that may help and this is a matter of discussion that uh, I think we have to take into consideration and uh, we can start asking to the audience if these patients, uh, these kind of patients may be approached or you do that uh, with your patients uh, as soon as you have uh, a, a picture like that. Do you use the driving pressure approach or you don't? The, the resident use it. The, the resident use it. Resident use it. I see, that, that, that's interesting. Because this is a, uh, Samir Jabez is saying that the resident uh, use, it, use this, but uh, the, the, the ones who had more experience, this is what you meant. What do you think about the, mass, mass, let's say? The driving pressure. Is the doctor that decides the driving pressure or the patient that decides the driving pressure? Uh, that, that's a very good question. Uh, I think there can be a combination of both. You know, this is a something, as you know, that has been done and been a, a conclusion achieved through a large, large retrospective database. And uh, looking at these retrospective database, really big data, uh, the conclusion was that uh, by using the driving pressure, there was certainly a protective effect that uh, uh, was uh, really determinant for the final outcome. But, again, for the moment, we do not have any prospective validation of this approach. 
and this must be said. Does, does anybody have strong ideas about driving pressure? The driving pressure, by the way, can even though the is uh, uh, the result of the uh, uh, relationship of the ratio between tidal volume and the compliance of the respiratory system, can be also roughly measured by the difference of between plateau pressure and PEEP. Driving pressure of our patient uh, was uh, higher than 14. Why did you decrease? Did she know? Why didn't you decrease? Why I didn't? Decrease. Oh. The driving pressure. We tried, but uh, unfortunately we were unable to do so. In supine or pole position? In both. In both. <laughs> we were very unlucky. So you could not control not necessarily also in this case. What to do then? What is the right driving pressure? These are the ventilatory management, by the way. Oh, driving pressure 19? Yes. yes, after a while, you know? So the tidal volume is under the limit that uh, uh, is the safe limit. The ideal body weight of this patient is 80, and the PEEP is 10, respiratory rate 18, and the PAO2, FIO2 is very low, and the plateau pressure is 32 at present, and the mean airway pressure is 26. The driving pressure, 19. What should you do at this point? Any questions? Somebody asked me a question, I always say, it depends. Yeah. That's always good stuff. So what does it depend on? Depends on what? Samino. Just to be provocative with my thing, could you give us the gas exchange, the PCO2, the pH, and the PRS2? Okay, that's Is correct. It possible to decrease the tidal volume? The PACO2 was increasing and uh, at present was uh, 48 and the pH uh, was uh, toward the acidotic limit, uh, let's say 7.32. Come on, I think that is unprotected. Yes, it is. But I would Did look you have anything to say regarding this? Yes, please. Now, Dr. Yoshida tells us why hypercapnia is protected. Okay, first, uh, hypercapnia is not always protected in Canada. Okay. And then, um, in, in this case, I think we have two options to decrease the driving pressure. First is to decrease the tidal volume. Okay. Increase the compliance with the lung recruitment. And I tend to choose lung recruitment in this case. Okay. This is a possibility. Aren't you worried no, about the... Please. You see, you gave me right answer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that's correct. Please. Is anything else that may worry you? What did you do? I was looking at you, the oxygenation index, which is this one, as you know. And uh, in a way or another, it may be an index of the lung dysfunction. And it's something that has been used for, from some groups in the world to decide or not, this may be questionable, if put the patient on ECMO or not. So the question is, at this point, can you do that as uh, Dr. Yoshida has suggested, or uh, would you put the patient right away on ECMO? 
There are groups, at least in certain parts of the world, that have started the uh, ECMO trial much earlier, much earlier, maybe at least since the very beginning. What's wrong with trying some recruitment? Absolutely nothing. But it, what happens if the recruitment does not work? And unfortunately, the patient does not improve. It means that the, the, the patient is less recruitable. And then, and this may be the case with our patient. And then, and then. Should you apply ECMO or not? Please. Thank you. So the prony did not change the lung function at all? Unfortunately not. Okay, well then there is only ECMO to go to. Stop, 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 stop there. Stop there. <laughs> who, said, who says the proning works if that's exchanging groups? Where is it written? That's a good point. Did you by chance do another CT scan after the proning? Uh, do uh, you heal the RDF by radiation? Absolutely. <laughs> It, it could be some, some people just proposing to use more and more and more CT scan. I know some of these people by chance. Oops. Now, if there is no proof at the maximum. Can you comment on the, the effect of proning? Most of my colleagues and myself do. We say that proning does not work because you do the same. The fact is that survival and proning, by proning, is not linked to the improvement in gas exchange. Am I right? Maybe from, to something else, that says the reduction of the ventilator induced lung injury. But that, that, that has nothing to do with ECMO. Right. Right? Correct. Now, if we're just to make the point that proning works, improving survival, independently on the change in oxygenation. Right. My question, though, was if nothing happened in the proning situation with lung recruitment, quote, unquote, yep. would you then do a lung recruitment maneuver? Because you've already done one passively, so to speak. If it doesn't work, why should continue to do that? Exactly. Let's move on. We are in the range where the situation is the one of a severe ADS. We have an oxygenation index that which is within the limits that uh, some groups suggested to study ECMO, and the patient was put on venous venous ECMO. I, don't, I will skip this. Uh, just to remind you that there was a revamp of the use of ECMO, venous venous ECMO, in the world during the H1N1 epidemia, and uh, these in certain part of the world who were not accustomed to use it, just uh, was applied in 4% of the cases. Just to remind you that despite this, its effectiveness, the uh, ECMO is not uh, a trivial uh, approach because it's uh, unfortunately weighted by some complications and some of them dangerous and life-threatening compl complications such as the hemorrhages. Whatever would be the final decision, the patient was put on ECMO and the blood flow is 4.5 liter. We have a gas flow or sweet flow, you, you can call it as uh, whatever you wish, is 2.5 liters. The PaO2 is 70 millimeters of mercury now. The FeO2 of the pump is 70, and the FeO2 on the ventilator is 80 percent. PEEP is 10 again. Tidal volume is uh, quite low, is 320, 4 ml per kilogram body weight. Plateau pressure is 28, and the uh, driving pressure is 13. So. It's, uh, I think, a, a good success somehow. What do you think about it? Those who use the ECMO believe that this may, it can be an acceptable achievement? Who uses ECMO? 
十半個鐘。Oh. Antibiotics? No, 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 no. What was the rest of the day? It's paralyzed. No, the rest of the day on echo. Ah, sorry. Nobody cares about the rest of the day on echo. Yeah, it was eight. Is too low? Depends. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. What can I do? No, the lower the rate, the lower the risk of pain. But the lower the rate, the higher the risk of pain improvement. That's correct. But in this case, you may increase the PIP, for instance. Oh, that's true. What was the PCO2 at this time? Under the normal limit now. Because the sweep so we imagine. The sweep gas is pretty low. Yeah. I could have blown off a lot more CO2 than that. We can increase the sweep flow yeah. just in case the PCO2 goes up. But you can basically turn off the Agreed. ventilator almost and put the patient on CPAP. Sometimes. No, just being provocative. <laughs> but one, one point I want to make that uh, after all, uh, if you look at the PAO2, uh, after I've input the patient on ECMO, someone may say that uh, it's not good enough and uh, may be surprised because it didn't improve that much. <laughs> Is that correct? Are you satisfied? And if you are not, do you have an idea why it's not so good as you may expect? What was the patient's cardiac output? The patient's cardiac output was, uh, I, if I remember correctly, something like uh, uh, six lit cardiac output, not cardiac index, uh, six liters per minute. Yeah. Why did you ask? Because there, there is a relationship between the ECMO blood flow and the cardiac output such that since you can only add five milliliters per volume of blood of oxygen, if you're running 100% ECMO flow to cardiac output, you have gotten a higher PO2, but 70 is high enough. It may be, but there are some others that say, oh, come on, this is something, or oh, some of the comments that often I receive from the residents, oh, we expect you to have much more, 100 millimeters of mercury or even more. Why this is not so? Why do you run this a report of membrane deoxygenation? <laughs> <laughs> this is not the case. Did you have a gradient between the arterial and the mixed venous PO2? Mm -hmm. Well, can you tell us why you aimed for such a low PO2? No, I didn't aim for such a low PO2 at all. I'm trying to understand why. You want to know why PO2 is so low or why you were happy? No, I'm not happy, but why am I so low? Or my, or why, why, which can be the other reason why the PAU2 is certainly low. I mean, you know, from my point of view, I'd be happy with certainly But someone may be not. Or why, why it is not as high as someone may expect? This is my question. It depends. <laughs> yes, please. But it depends how you position your cannula and how you verify the position of your cannula. Okay. You might have some degree of recirculation. That's correct. This was not the case, by the way, because they are correctly positioned. 
and verify by uh, transesophageal echocardiography and uh, uh, chest X-ray. Um, because the venous uh, echo, the, this is a powerful kind of bypass, and therefore uh, with uh, the uh, obligatory venous testing, uh, the, if you do not have any uh, negative lung function, the best that could be achieved the SPO test will only be A5. So with an increase in cardiac output, that would be even worse. But, but, but why not have What's wrong with the pure flow seven? Nothing is wrong with that. So, the reason why the pure flow seventy is because my good friend Massimo decided it was good enough. What would you do to raise pure two? Suppose you want hundred and twenty of pure two. What? What would you have to do? Who has the answer for that? Come on, kids. There is not much you can do. You can raise the blood flow. You can increase speed. You can try to blow up the lung again. And see if it is more recruitable than before. But on ECMO. No, driving pressure is much ah. lower. Airway pressure are much lower. ECMO, not going with ECMO, is not to get 300 of PO2, is to avoid damage to the lung while you work a reasonable pure oxygenation. 70 of pure 2. It's good. It's good. But the difference between pre ECMO and post ECMO is that the, the management of the lung is totally different. The management of the lung here is protective. Probably it would have been even more protective instead if instead of 8 of rate, we said you can lower rate. But you, you know, there is often a, the misconception that uh, in our patient we should keep the PAO2 very, very high. And this is something that may just uh, compromise the correct reasonment. Why it's in m more, many, many, many different uh, situations has been uh, 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 clearly showed that uh, even lower level of PAO2 are not only compatible with the survival, but also more beneficial. Now, you, uh, you agree, or you don't agree? Do you agree? No, we probably should say clearly that the reason why we put patients on ECMO in this situation is to allow life to rest and heal. Correct. The question is for how long, which is probably open for debate, and depends again. <laughs> you learn too quickly, you know. <laughs> You are a good teacher then. Well, the, the other point that I want to make is that uh, something that we may expect uh, not being as efficient as uh, other mechanisms in oxygenating the patient may be due to a physiological reason. We know that we do have an anatomical compartment shunt and we do have a perfusion ratio. And this is a large part related to the size of the lung that is compromised, the global perfusion, and the epoxic stimulus. What happens when we do apply the, uh, the uh, ECMO? That we remove the hypoxic vasoconstriction. So one of the reasons why we may have uh, not the improvement we expected by using ECMO is that we are just removing the vasoconstriction in a way or another you increase the shunt level. So, can I interrupt you once? Yes, of course. This is what I wanted. Why, why, why is, is it there that we remove hypoxic vasoconstriction? Is it there? 
you should answer it, de it depends. So is it bad? It depends, not always at least. We are almost uh, close so to the end. But I think it's uh, something that we have to think about because at, at least uh, some residents <coughs> at the beginning, uh, may be surprised of these effects and they don't care about uh, the reliability of the system just because the lack of this physiological improvement. So it's something that we have to think about and induce the youngers to reflect on. Well, this is the values of the patients uh, after a few days of uh, uh, ECMO. And uh, something happened here. I would like to have a comment uh, from you on these. What do you think? You. For example, yes? You need a But it's not a white sand. Okay. I mean, most people are the same. Hemoglobin, decent. My doctor is okay. Split with guns. Doesn't worry me. Sodium potassium chloride. Fine. Sorry for that. Yeah, it's increased. Is in compromising. Is an effect of the initial hypoperfusion that was more determinant uh, than we expected, or the effect of the toxic shock that he had, or we don't know. But still, the situation of the kidney function is the, that one. Samir, yeah. wanna say something? Just I ask for good like that, like that, because I said. It No, yeah, but lactate we're almost practically normal. It's a renal insufficiency. But the lactate? Normal. There is some, not hypercarbia, but you know, above the normal level. So the combination of these two effects may have. Yes, please. Yes, sure. Uh, 
one thing that I forgot to say, because we are almost at the end, is that uh, the patient had uh, at the beginning uh, a, an antigenuria positive for Legionella, so it was a uh, atypical uh, pneumonia, but in the course of the disease, this was complicated by an additional uh, pseudomonas infection into the lung. Both were treated. This is the end. Patients uh, was on ECMO for six days. On day 10, uh, uh, after the removal of ECMO, was wind by from the mechanical ventilation. And on day 13, was discharged in the ward, but still on intermittent dialysis. Should have you done something different? Any final comment? Would you have done anything? What have you done, uh, Antonio, uh, as a final comment? I think probably <coughs> ECMO was good in this case. No, my, my question is, should have you applied uh, ECMO earlier than it was done in this case, or it should done exactly the, uh, within the same time frame? Because it's a quite a short run for ECMO. So I think it was uh, done at the right time. And another point that I want to make uh, is the winning from ECMO. After how long, which are the starting point from which we can believe that the patient is winnable from ECMO. And I would like to receive some comments from you. Samir? You see, this is something that uh, I will show in one of the uh, further uh, lectures and talks that I have to, to give. But it's something that we are working on that. You know that there is a, for the moment, there are some, some suggestions coming from the literature. But you know that we are running a, a trial in, a, in Europe, which is called Supernova which is supported by the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine and where an ultra, ultra protective strategy is applied together with venous, venous CO2 removal. Maybe you can ask the audience. Yes. Ask we are speaking about ECCOR, extracorporeal CO2 removal. The major difference, let's say, just for be simplistic, is the blood flow, because whilst when you have an ECMO, you have to exploit these kind of flows that I showed in this case, if you apply the extracorporeal CO2 removal, rarely you go up, let's say, 500, 700, within one liters uh, per minute. Is anybody who applies uh, the extracorporeal CO2 removal in these patients, would you please rise up your hands for those who do that? <laughs> Nobody does. So, it's an experimental technique. Damn! <laughs> this is just a, the final sentence. This is an experimental technique. <laughs> thank so, thank you very much for your participation. We are closing on time. Thank you.